uh, for nuclear and particle physics uh, intersect with uh, the hyperpolarization ideas that are discussed during this meeting, both uh, for nuclear polarization and on the end of the para-hydrogen uh, uh, production. So I'm going to speak about two different subjects today. First, I'll talk about um, neutron searches for time reversal violation uh, in the fundamental forces of nature and how that is related <laughs> to the polarization of tin 117 via Sabre techniques. The second completely different subject is um, a discussion of a very large volume, essentially pure liquid para hydrogen uh, target that we made for uh, a neutron proton uh, parity violation experiment. Um, and uh, I don't have time to speak about other subjects that uh, hyperpolarization is used for in neutron physics, but uh, um, uh, uh, I will restrict myself to those two subjects. So that's my plan. So I should start with a very brief uh, introduction of um, three so-called discrete symmetries of nature um, uh, that are used in nuclear and particle physics to classify uh, the four fundamental forces we know of, the strong, weak gravity and electromagnetic interactions. Um, hey so, Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you go to a slideshow? It might make the screen bigger. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm worried that if I do that, something may disappear. Uh, <laughs> Sure, you want me to try? Please. Uh, well, well, okay, if you have to stop, and then we'll. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are can you see it? Yep. Looks good. Okay. Fine. Um, Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so um, uh, the three symmetries of nature that are used to classify the four forces um, are parity symmetry, where you reflect things in a mirror. R goes to minus R. Uh, charge conjugation, which is basically the exchange of particles and antiparticles, and uh, time reversal. Uh, these are called P, C, and T. Time reversal literally is uh, running uh, the clock backwards, setting T goes to minus T. And you can ask the following question of the four forces of nature, how do they change or not change if you um, make these three different types of transformations? And the very interesting thing is that uh, there is one of the four forces, the so-called weak interaction of nature, violates uh, the th all three of these symmetries. Uh, so parity violation uh, in fundamental interactions was discovered in the mid fifties, by the way, using polarized cobalt nuclei, as it turns out. Uh, and charge conjugation violation also was seen uh, in uh, the, uh, uh, the early sixties as well. Um, a combination of the so-called the combination of charge conjugation and parity was uh, violation was seen in the mid 60s. Uh, and we don't understand the physical reason for this observation, but it's very important to try to understand it better and to search in other places. And then finally, in 1999, direct time reversal violation in a fundamental interaction of nature was observed. And, and as, as I said, we don't understand these um, violations and we very much want to uh, search for uh, where they could be happening in other physical systems. And that is one of the things that makes a connection uh, to uh, the subject of interest today. Um, and in particular, the time reversal violation is especially interesting, not only because it, of its um, influence in uh, uh, fundamental uh, particle physics, but also for cos cosmological reasons, because um, we know uh, when we look out in space, we don't see big hunks of antimatter because if were, they were out there, uh, they should light up like a candle as the dust in the universe, you know, goes into antimatter galaxies and annihilates, and we don't see that. And you can ask the following question. What properties would the laws of physics have to have so that in the Big Bang theory of cosmology, you could start from what we think is an even amount of matter and antimatter and make a non-zero lopsidedness in, uh, and, and have matter win out. And this very interesting question was answered theoretically by Andrei Sakharov in the 50s. And it turns out you need three ingredients to start from uh, no lopsidedness in the number of um, uh, amount of matter and antimatter and dynamically generate a non-zero amount. And, uh, uh, the three ingredients you need is, is you have to have a way to transform matter into any matter. Uh, 
but you also need to violate both uh, thermal equilibrium because uh, if, you're, if you're in thermal equilibrium and you start with uh, even amounts of matter and antimatter, you can't generate uh, uh, any lopsidedness because uh, by definition, thermodynamics is, means that all variables are time independent. Um, so you need those two aspects of the three uh, conditions that Sakharov pointed out. But the third one's of what the one I'm interested in to say something about today, namely we need time reversal violation as well. But as I said before, um, it's a mystery. Uh, we see time reversal violation in nature, uh, but we don't understand it. And in addition, uh, uh, the amount of time reversal we've seen so far is not big enough to make the size of the matter antimatter asymmetry uh, that we see today. Therefore, if you believe this cosmological argument, uh, there are new sources of time reversal violation uh, out there waiting to be discovered. And I'm gonna talk about one which involves uh, polarized tin 117. Uh, so the concept of um, how this works is that we think at very early times there are uh, uh, a large amount of matter and any matter that almost all annihilated and left a very small residual amount of matter, which then went on to make all the stuff that we know about. Uh, and we know that the great majority of particles in the universe are photons. And so this, it's usually expressed in terms of this so-called ratio, which is measured by cosmological measurements. So we want to look for time reversal violation in systems where um, we can do a sensitive search. And there is one that involves um, nuclei, heavy nuclei. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, if a neutron goes into a nucleus, there are narrow resonances in the nu neutron nucleus system. And the neutron can spend a factor of a million longer time in a resonance than it can in a normal condition. And it has already been observed that parity violation is amplified in certain nuclei by a factor of a million uh, in the interaction. Uh, and that's that what that means is that certain heavy nuclei act as amplifiers of discrete symmetry violations. The same mechanism uh, is predicted also to amplify time reversal violation if it exists in the neutron nucleus system. So what we want to do is uh, search for uh, these uh, possible time reversal violating effects in this very uh, sensitive neutron nucleus system. And the way we want to do that is we want to pass a polarized neutron beam through a polarized nuclear target. That's again where the polarized tin 117 comes in. And as it turns out, uh, there's a term in the index, neutron index for refraction that has um, a term that violates both parity and time reversal symmetries. And so we want to look for that term. It's this so-called D term in this equation here. Uh, but we need uh, a polarized nuclear target to do so. And furthermore, we need it to be in the right kind of nucleus. Um, so conceptually, the way to think about what we're doing is we're in a sense running the film backwards in this uh, uh, search for time reversal invariance. Um, uh, so you may ask, how can you test time reversal? Because you can't reverse time, the flow of time in a laboratory, but what you can do is you can imagine a system set up in an initial condition that dynamically involves for some time, then take that system and time reverse its final conditions and see whether or not it retraces its steps. And if it does not retrace its steps, that's a violation of time reversal invariance. And of course, if you reverse time, you have to reverse the direction of spin too, because you're now spinning in the opposite direction. So we have a apparatus uh, uh, design for doing this that involves uh, uh, rotating the apparatus and having the beam flow backwards through the target in a sense uh, that I don't have time to describe the details of. Um, uh, but uh, the interesting thing is there's only a small number of nuclei where this amplification mechanism has been demonstrated. And I, I show them here in this uh, uh, plot. Uh, the the y-axis is the size of the uh, symmetry violation and the x-axis is the neutron energy. And what you'll see is that TIN-117 in particular uh, is on the list as a nucleus that has one of these resonances where uh, the time reversal effect is greatly amplified. 
Uh, and that's the reason why you see the, um, uh, the abstract submitted to this meeting where um, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the Sabre technique has recently been applied to the TIN-117 isotope uh, of TIN. And there's an encouraging uh, amplification of the polarization above its equilibrium value. Um, uh, and we're very excited because if it's shown that we can make a large enough volume of TIN-117 nuclei uh, using this technique, then we can do a very sensitive search for time reversal violation uh, uh, in the system. So that's the end of my first part of my talk. Uh, uh, the, very, the quick summary is that um, uh, using polarized TIN-117 nuclei, uh, we can do a very sensitive search for uh, time reversal violation that is very interesting for cosmology and particle physics. So now I'm going to jump to the second uh, part of my talk. Uh, and that is um, uh, more on the pair hydrogen uh, um, uh, um, production mechanisms. So uh, this, the, I'll explain uh, what we did here, but this was a part of a, a so-called NPD gamma collaboration. Uh, we did an experiment where we tried to measure the weak interaction between the neutron and the proton. And remember the weak interaction violates mirror symmetry, violates that P. So we looked for a P violation in the neutron proton interaction. And our protons were uh, made of hydrogen, okay? So the actual physical process we uh, 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 investigated was we polarized a neutron beam and dumped it into a liquid parahydrogen target. And then we looked for the lopsidedness of the gamma rays that uh, go up or down versus, uh, relative to the direction of the neutron spin. And an asymmetry there would signal uh, the breaking of mirror symmetry. Uh, and we wanted parahydrogen because we wanted something that not, did not depolarize or flip the neutron spin as it went into the liquid target. And as you know, parahydrogen has J equals L equals S equals zero. So it's a spherically symmetric blob that won't depolarize a neutron. Uh, and uh, this was a, a quick, conceptual view of the apparatus. I don't have time to talk about anything except the target. Um, so let me jump to the target uh, now. This is a picture of the apparatus. And what you see is this silver thing is a uh, liquid parahydrogen target cryostat with a, um, uh, a large fill vent line for safety of hydrogen. This uh, liquid target that uh, I'm discussing had a volume of 16 liters. So it was not a small amount of uh, parahydrogen. And uh, what was interesting about this um, system is that we can actually measure with very high sensitivity what is the fraction of parahydrogen and orthohydrogen inside our liquid parahydrogen target because the neutron cross section for orthohydrogen is a factor of almost 100 larger than, uh, uh, than parahydrogen because of the dynamics of uh, the nuclear physics involved in the neutron proton interaction. And so we're the, the new, as the neutron beam was going through this liquid parahydrogen target, we were very sensitive to whether or not there was any orthohydrogen uh, or not. Um, and uh, so we had to make as pure a parahydrogen target as we could possibly do. Um, and we used the fact that uh, the neutrons are very sensitive to the amount of orthohydrogen uh, to, um, uh, to do this measurement. We, it, also the uh, neutron interaction cross-section a, is a sharp and very no, well-known function of neutron energy. And so the shape of this cross-section uh, was an indicator for us of how much worthal hydrogen we had. So, uh, and this, this is just a quick Monte Carlo to show that it, it, there's a huge difference in uh, what happens to the neutrons as they would go inside our target whether, depending on whether or not it was liquid parahydrogen or orthohydrogen, if it was orthohydrogen, the neutrons literally wouldn't get inside of our, you know, 30 centimeter long target. And only in the case of parahydrogen do they even get in. The orthohydrogen, they just bounce off the front face. How did we make such pure parahydrogen? This may be the point that's of most interest to the audience here. We had a, uh, refrigerator, which liquefied hydrogen from room temperature gas, 
And the liquid flowed down into an ortho repair converter. It's the usual your rust that people typically use. And then the, the thing that was a little bit special about us is that we uh, overfilled the target on purpose. And in the exit tube, we had a heater. And we turned the heater on. That would evaporate the hydrogen and make it would force the hydrogen to recirculate in a constant flow through the orthodoparic catalyst um, uh, continuously. And we discovered that um, uh, that procedure, uh, as far as we can tell from our neutron measurements, um, which we uh, held the target at 15 and a half Kelvin, we made para-hydrogen of fraction 99.985% in this method. We also showed that people who did, have not done this convective circulation through the catalyst uh, ha must have had, uh, based on our measurements, some ortho-hydrogen contamination. In other words, you didn't go all the way down to the thermal equilibrium value uh, that you'd expect based on statistical mechanics. So this work is published in this paper in Frisrev B a few years ago. And in the near future, uh, we will publish a very detailed paper on the cryogenics uh, and the measurements of the neutrons and the thermodynamics of the target, which uh, show in detail how you make this uh, very large volume of essentially pure uh, para-hydrogen. So uh, I think that's uh, pretty much the, uh, the, the, uh, the end of my talk. So uh, I'll, let me state, state the conclusions in the following way. Uh, we made uh, 16 liters of extremely pure para-hydrogen. Uh, as far as we could tell, there was no deviation at all um, in between what we would expect from thermal equilibrium and what we measured with neutrons uh, to the precision of four or five digits. Um, and the other message is that we care very much about uh, the technique of um, SABER for uh, polarizing nuclei in general. In particular, the polarized uh, uh, tin 117 isotope is extremely interesting to us. And maybe the question I'd want to uh, ask the audience or maybe to think about is uh, in this chart that I'm showing here on my final slide, if you see any isotopes uh, either in the dark circles or even the dotted circles that you think you could polarize in significant amounts like grams or beyond in, uh, uh, in mass, please contact us because uh, we, we could uh, collaborate and do a, uh, uh, a serious um, uh, nuclear particle astrophysics experiment with such a target. I'm done. All right, thank you very much, Mike. That was an awesome introduction to this topic. Uh, we do have some questions that I'm gonna hit you with. Uh, and then I think Matt's gonna ask one at the end of, of these. So uh, first, this is from John Blanchard, uh, who's also gonna be speaking in this session. Um, what's the Z scaling of the proposed interaction? In other words, how important are heavy atoms? Do we need to start polarizing 239 plutonium? <laughs> uh, no, it really doesn't help, for, at least for this particular um, way of looking for time reversal violation that uh, uh, I mentioned. Um, it, it's, it's kind of the luck of nuclear physics, whether or not the, a particular nucleon, nu, neutron nucleus resonance amplifies the symmetry. So th this uh, list I'm showing here in this plot uh, is our measurements where we know that the time reversal violation would be amplified because we've seen the parity violation greatly amplified and the mechanism is the same. So there's no guarantee that there's any Z dependence to anything. Uh, I will say that we do want heavy nuclei because if the nucleus is heavy, it, it tends to have enough of the, a, a large enough density of these resonances accessible to the neutron beam energies we uh, care about. So I hope that answered the question. Uh, yes, next, also from John, uh, for cesium, could you use spin exchange optical pumping? Yeah, and um, the, the, the issue there is getting enough polarized nuclei. So yeah, we can get uh, polarized the hell out of cesium in, with spin exchange and have a, a gas. Uh, but now the amounts of matter that we need to, uh, pu pu to really fully use the neutron beam um, interaction with the medium, we want typically 
you know, sort of uh, macroscopic amounts of polarized nuclei and like almost, you know, liquid or solid densities, or if you had a gas and you compressed the hell out of it. So cesium is worth thinking about, uh, but I, I don't quite, uh, I think at the moment we have slightly better candidates and um, uh, probably tin is actually uh, a, a little bit better than cesium at the moment based on what we've seen so far with the uh, progress in the, uh, uh, the saber. All right. Um, Kirill uh, uh, asked, uh, what is the molecule with the 10117? And I'll, I'll spare Mike from having to answer that. Uh, so that's, it's the same molecule that, that Simon uh, polarized previously to do 119, uh, five tributyl uh, stanyl pyrimidine. Uh, but uh, you can imagine a number of other 10 functionalized compounds. The good news is Mike doesn't care. <laughs> that's right. So, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, if you wanted to comment on the end of that. Yeah, basically, the uh, for this time reversal test, we only care about the neutrons in a specific energy that matches the neutron nucleus resonance of interest. And uh, as long as we can get enough nuclei uh, neutrons at that energy, uh, um, and the lighter nuclei have no sharp resonances, so they won't interfere with anything. All right, and then I'll be quiet so Matt can come on and ask his physics -y question. Oh boy, this is great. You know, I was in grad school in the early 90s and so in Tim Chubb's lab. And so NPD gamma, you know, all the experiments at Grenoble, all these spin structure function, uh, you know, measurements, all the low temperature particle physics to look at time reversal. This is my favorite stuff in the world. So my question is, um, you know, one of the things about using helium three as a target was that the spin structure function, of course, was pretty much all the neutron and the polarization was pretty much all the neutron. It was all S state. So a long time has gone by since those measurements. And so like how much more sophisticated do your models have to be in terms of interpreting the use of parahydrogen as a target, right? Is that question clear? I mean, it was so, I mean, in part, we used helium in part because we could get high, high polarizations, but it was like undergraduate easy to interpret. And so how right. much has that changed or does that have to change when you use these uh, saber sources? Uh, yeah, it's a, slightly different ball game for this time reversal test. Basically, uh, if we see a non-zero time reversal effect in this experiment, even though it's a big nucleus and you may not be able to interpret things, that's a major discovery and worth a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and so later on, you know, you may find out the dynamics of exactly who was the guilty thing that made the time reversal. But, uh, I see. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a different situation than trying to do a precision measurement of uh, the quantity of the type you're, you're talking about. And so in that case, then you don't need to do the co-magnetometry or, or sort of like high Z, low Z experiments like we used to do with xenon and, hel xenon and helium, because you're just looking for something as a foot in the door. Exactly. Oh, uh, that's right. So, okay. um, uh, you know, we, um, uh, there, we have very many ways to get rid of systematic errors in this measurement that are, uh, there are some similarities with electric dipole moment searches, some overlap in the physics, but it's, uh, um, they're complimentary and, uh, uh, and this is, uh, again, a good 